This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists to entertain and to inform. Meanwhile, at the Borg Historians Podcast Studio. Hey, Mike, you got here early. You all excited to record or something? No, not particularly. Ah, it hurts. Hey, guys. Oh, what's all this, Mike? What are all these little medicine ampules doing on your desk? Guys, I did it. You filled the studio with bottles of poison again, didn't you? No, it's the opposite. I made a medicine. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, this is a cure for that feeling some people get when they're all bummed out that it's fall again. Who gets bummed out about Halloween and pretty trees? Uh, to some people, fall just means winter is coming. Okay, Ned Stark. So this orangish, brackish liquid in these little sealed glass bottles is the cure for the whatever the feeling of not liking fall is? Yes. Okay, so what's in the bottles? Well, I can't tell you that. Why not? Because it'll fall into the hands of the communists. Duh. Wow. Did, wait, Mike, did you read ahead to get ready for the show today? What? No. Why? Never mind. Hey, y'all. Sorry I'm late. Whoa. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, why does it smell like pumpkin spice in here? Real lame, Mike. Basic, Max. It's basic. It's that, too. Okay. Let's start the show. Because pumpkin knew, spice was in the ampules. I knew that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know. <laughs> I had to do. I wanted to do a little different twist, like pumpkin no, spice and ampules. No, Nobody's no. doing that. No, that's, no. that's true. No, nobody. Is. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, the podcast misadventuring into the archives of medical history and beyond. I'm Dr. Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Dr. Aaron. Yup. You did that one before. I need a different one. I did not. I did not do a yup before. I know for sure. definitely done a yup. Alba, has he done a yup? No, I've not done a yup. Not in that goofy style. And by, Uh, I mean like the goofy, the dog. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, No, we're going to allow it. We're just going to push on. Hello, hello, hello. You've kind of done that one too. And Dr. Mike. I did an echo before? What are you talking about? Okay, the echo. will give you the echo. Dr. Mike, hi, you're here. Hello. Turn down for what? (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. I have no notes. And you've already given it away, but we also have our medical history intern, Alba. Hi, Alba. Hey. What were they turning down for? Sorry. Why are you sad? (laughs) What? (laughs) Oh, they were turning down for what? Yeah. I mean, like the word? What is what stand for? Yeah, you hear the word what, and then everybody just gets all quiet and subdued. And I think, I think the. Little it's actually a is form of Ethiopian that. bread, I think, or sauce. I, I never knew which. What, what is? <laughs> exactly. Wait, no, is don't... turning down a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. It has to be a good you're thing. You're turning thing. down like you're getting Little crazy. John is really excited about no, it. I think so you get right? a good thing. crunked if you get turned down. <laughs> no, but it's turnt, isn't it? Is that what this is? Well, but then because the other thing is like, you know, when you need to turn it down and you're asking like, turn down for what? Like, why would I do that? It. You know, do you think we can get little John on the uh, show? Do you think he would do our show? <laughs> With, yeah. Wait, but if, so if he turns yeah. us down for the interview, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> but for what? So for yeah. what would he turn us down for? We are right? dangerously no good close reason. to an Abbott and Costello <laughs> pit right now. And I, I'm here for it. Turn down yeah, for Ethiopian good. bread. <laughs> I don't even know how you <laughs> what you can't write that. <laughs> is that what is it? Hey, um, so uh, hi, hi, audience. Wait, there's another song. There's that the song about the Indian bread, the naan, 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 that one, yeah. They just must really love buffets. Remember, we used to have patrons because we're not going to anymore. We're going to be talking about bread and. Hi, hi, listener, if you're a big fan of the show and you appreciate uh, what we're doing over here and you want to count yourself among the super fans, we invite you to check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash poor historians podcast or via link in the show notes. Get access to episodes early, an occasional bonus episode and converse with us and other men- other members of the PH pod community. All those proceeds do go back into hosting and production of the show. I think it's about time we give out some non-medical opinions. And that means before we get to the main show, we do want to warm up the brain meats. And this is the non-medical opinion segment. The brain meat again. I just, I don't know. (laughs) 
No. You don't like great uh, meat? That's how the liver king stays all jacked. It's, it's, it's <laughs> not Mike's favorite meat. Mm-hmm. This is the non-medical opinion <laughs> segment. Since we don't give He's medical advice up. on this show, we figured we'd do the next best thing and use our medical and medical adjacent knowledge to give a lucky listener the best pearls of wisdom on a topic not having to do with medicine. Who we got this week, Alba? This week, our asker is Sean. Sean asks, what do you think is the most efficient form of martial arts? Ooh, that's a good question. And I think we are definitely non-medically qualified to answer that. What's the one where you like pluck out an eyeball or like rip out a heart? (laughs) Is that Kung Fu? It's Feng Shui. That's that's what that is. That is definitely Feng Shui. Yep. Yep. You do that. (laughs) Whatever one it is, that's efficiency if you ask me. All right. Aaron, what do you think the uh, most efficient martial art is, in your opinion? Um, it's got to be capoeira. Oh, excellent. Great. That's actually probably real. Why would you say it's efficient, though? Well, because you immediately get to the point of the fight, which is to look pretty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think that's actually a reasonable uh, defense of that. Yeah. All right, Mike, what do you it's got? Beautiful. Um, I watched... Uh, I think it was a YouTube video one time of these two drunk Russian guys in what looked to be an old gulag. And the guy was like teaching this martial art and it was just using like open fists and slapping Mm. with really limp wrists. Okay. And I'll, I'll try to find it. I'll, I'll link it to the show notes. Oh, that's what's that slap fighting amazing. thing in Vegas? Yeah. I oh, stand no, there? no, that one's different. That's them just slapping each other. Yeah. But this is like. Can I, can I be vulnerable and say that I I was watching slap fighting on the internet before, like when it was underground and I got to know that a lot of like the characters. It seems like it'd be more fun when it's, it's underground. It's so, it's so like damaging to their brains though. I can't, yeah. I can't abide it. But yeah. I, I mean, horrible. It's definitely. Not the most. I don't know if it's the most. It's efficient. It's efficient. It's efficient. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's one one hit straight to the brain. Maybe it That's is. Just... You know what? Maybe the right answer is slap fight. But I I'm going to go with aikido because if you know anything about aikido, it's basically zero to sixty BS. It's just complete. Isn't that Steven Seagal? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He is, remember yes. when he was on our show? He was. On He's our show the master. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was calling Aaron. <laughs> oh, good times. Yeah. All right, so. Sh- Sean, I hope one of those answers is correct enough to make your life better and that you can take it and apply it in whichever way it sounds reasonable. There I just realized it. if anyone recognizes me on the street, they're going to be like, what do I look pretty to you, punk? And then <laughs> I'm going to get my... You shave. Nobody's going to recognize you. That's good. That's, that's <laughs> my disguise. We are, by the way, listeners, still looking for questions to use here. So good chance you send me one. It will probably make it in the show pretty quickly. So please... Go ahead and do so. Go through the link in the show notes and uh, go over to our, it'll take you over to our webpage to our submission form and we will toss it out there. Let's get to the main segment. All right, well, I guess the main segment time, that's, that's me. Before I get started with what I'm going to talk about, I want to give a special thanks to Matthew Ehrlich, who is the author of The Cribios and Hoax. How a Mysterious Cancer Drug Shook Organized Medicine. And spoiler alert, if you didn't look at the title of the show, that's that's what we're going to be talking about today. But uh, Matthew Ehrlich was kind enough to send me a copy of the book. Just got released last month, I believe. Hot off the presses. Wait, provide... he did or the book did? The, the, what's it again? <laughs> <laughs> He's hot off the presses to provide the primary and main source for this topic. And we encourage all of you listeners out there to go check it out. Add it to your real or e-library, especially if, like me, you do enjoy learning about quackery and medical history. So, this story starts with a sales pitch in Chicago in 1947, and that's just a mere 69 years before the Cubs would win the World Series again. (laughs) That's that's nice, right? Yeah. Did they win the World Series? Did they? Nice. They did. They did again. Six. I looked it up. It was 69 years after 1947. Just happened to be that way. (laughs) That's so, the most way back thing then, ever. the an Argentinian businessman named Umberto Lortani calls a meeting in Chicago with these two other American businessmen, one of which is involved in medical devices, and the other of which is has something to do with Beverly Hills real estate. And I'm not really sure how those two things relate to each other, but I guess they were besties or something. And so the the Umberto calls up these guys and he says, "Hey, I represent a company named Duga." 
Yes, that's I get <laughs> Duga or Duga, G U G A, mm. uh, based out of Buenos Aires. And it just so happens that we are trying to bring a drug to the American market. We have a new treatment for high blood pressure, and that drug is called Cositerin. And it cures hypertension, again, high blood pressure. If I use those terms interchangeably, I don't mean to, but it cures high blood pressure according to the man who discovered it. Who will be a key player here. Mm. And that guy's name was Dr. Stefan Durovic. Or maybe it's Durovic. Call me maybe crazy, but Steven. I'm suspicious. Are you suspicious? Did I? <laughs> I'm suspicious. Okay. Was it the title of the show that might have made you suspicious or most of what I said already? Well, if I didn't get it from the from the title of the show, it would the cure for high blood pressure part. Mm. Sounds a little suspicious. You have too. noticed we still have high blood pressure as an issue. Yeah, so, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, that's the thing. Yeah, here we go. And it's not 1947 anymore, so. It is not. Mm. So, Durovich is described as a genius by, well, by the, the Argentinian businessman, at least. Durovich is a Yugoslavian doctor that was held prisoner during World War II and escaped thanks to the efforts and aid of the Vatican, allowing him to flee to Argentina, where he Wait. set upon his life's work and discovered a, a cure for second. high blood pressure. Why are you suspicious? What? So I know <laughs> that there's some stories insane. of guys around in this area in World War II that were moved to mm. South America, and they were normally the bad guys. I know what you're thinking. This is not that, apparently. Oh, it's not. Okay. It's, it is not that. I see what I was thinking the same thing, but it is not. He is not a uh, Nazi. Nazi doctor that escaped. Okay. There's a lot of there's a lot about this gentleman that is not exactly true. It is true. It appears that he was a Yugoslavian doctor. That that much I will say is true at this point. I mean, did did the Vatican save a lot of prisoners? I that see none of that can that w- was clear. Any of that had any actual relationship to reality it just yeah i think that's all why didn't they just bring him to the vatican i mean it's like an (sighs) encapsulated city that should be protected because then he wouldn't have been part of the story okay (laughs) probably not (laughs) okay so that high blood pressure drug is called cosoterin and dr durovic wouldn't tell the businessmen how he made it what it was made from what it was but he was very sure it worked because he himself had tested it on about 5,000 patients back home in Argentina. Therefore, he, he swears these, that it is safe and it's effective and it cures high blood pressure. The U.S. businessman saw enough of that and said, you know what? Great. I believe everything you're saying. We, wanted to have, we do want to have that information checked out by a responsible U.S. medical institution, which happens to be Northwestern University. You guys know it probably right. Down in mm-hmm. Chicago, close to mm-hmm. Alba. Kind of kind of famous. I heard the other day it was the most expensive university in the country right now. I mm. would not be surprised. It's like $89,000 a year. Nice. Or like what? That. Oh, Oof. my. Yikes. I bet oh nobody my. pays that full tuition price except for the suckers. It's probably that expensive <laughs> <laughs> because... Nice qualifier there, Mike. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if it's a state school. Well, hey, it might be that expensive because they... They don't end up being the bad guy in this story. They make smarter decisions than <laughs> other universities. So no, I, the Northwestern University doctors are like, sure, we'll try this Coasteran out on a handful of patients for about a week. And they are astonished at how much it does not, in fact, work or cure high blood pressure. It does nothing. And though a lot of them had pretty openly suspected that Durovich was a quack, I like to assume they wanted to be that Midwestern nice and just sort of give them a chance, mm-hmm. you know, give no. the drug a chance. But, Sorry, Northwestern is not Midwestern nice. That's I 100% agree with you. That's Chicago mean. There's yeah. a little bubble right around where Alba lives. I'm nice, though. You're nice, yeah. I'm not saying I'm everybody good. is, but it's You're Chicago. It's a big a small city. bubble in Chicago. For the most part, people are nice. Every once in a while, I get sworn at. But, you know, that's Chicago, baby. That's city that living. True. Hey, hey. <laughs> it's usually a rat doing the swearing. Yeah, it's usually a rat swing. Eating your <laughs> deep dish pizza? Yeah. <laughs> giving me a shakedown for a bitch. <laughs> so the doctors weren't very impressed with it there at Northwestern. And one doctor wrote he was, quote, dismissing and filing in the archives of useless results, the f- efforts on Kosaterin. <laughs> another, I really like that. Another <laughs> said that Durovich was, quote, either intellectually dishonest or stupid beyond my ken. Wow. So they, <laughs> they were not fans. 
Northwestern University, prestigious medical institution that it is, said, thanks, but no thanks. However, you know what? They did know somebody they thought would probably be interested in this amazing opportunity over at a rival school, the University of Illinois. Mm, uh, <laughs> that's about to be my alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you Well, nice. sure. this is going to get awkward for you. Cool. <laughs> I think they straightened things out now. This was a long time ago. I wouldn't worry too Fingers much about crossed. it. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Now, that referral was not by accident. And by sending Durovich over to the U of I, a series of events was about to set in motion that became this multi-decade farce in the history of medicine. It just so happened that the University of Illinois hired, or maybe poached in their words, a preeminent scientist from Northwestern. And that scientist was named Dr. Andrew Ivey, who is a world-renowned physiologist, who was also known for a lot of sciencey things at the time, just he wasn't so much of a clinician, and I want to put a pin in that for right now. Dr. Ivey was nominated by the American Medical Association as an expert advisor to the Nuremberg trials. Mike, speaking of speaking of Nazis. There it is. I knew it was coming. So Dr. Ivey basically <laughs> helped. You weren't wrong. Dr. Ivey basically helped form a case to prosecute Nazi doctors there at Nuremberg. And, and I'll tell you what, we like that about him. Yeah, that's great. But how would a physiologist help um he would you know what he would do he'd probably lecture them about kidney physiology and he'd just put them to sleep yeah no they're like <laughs> oh no you know what um just electrocute me <laughs> i don't think they handed that kind of punishment down though at the Nuremberg what trials. capital punish didn't, didn't, didn't they? yeah didn't they hang most of the people he tried i don't oh, know Oh yeah that's kind of the way they would do it he was once also scientific director for the U.S. Naval Research Institute, where he claimed to have discovered the existence of more hormones than any man alive. <laughs> Do you know why? It's because he's checking all the belly buttons. Ooh. Why would he need to research navels? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Don't laugh at that. It's oh. not funny. It's I, not I funny. stopped short, yeah. Mm. <laughs> There's so anyway, more, but I'm not going to do it. But yeah, and the hormone thing, interesting. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. He's, he, and honestly, it might it might have been true. It, it's, uh, it's otherwise uh, an odd flex if you're not a physiologist. But uh, hey, in their world, that's, that's huge. You're the hormone guy. Endocrinologists have posters of this guy on their wall like back in the day. It was a big deal. Could you see him like giving a speech, kind of like Trump, like, I've discovered more hormones than any other man alive. Oh, look at all these hormones I've discovered. <laughs> I honestly thought that when I was reading so this. Many, so many quote, hormones. That quote <laughs> so comes many. from him. So he, I think, yes. I think the answer is yes. That is, yeah. Is, yeah. But, look at all these hormones, some great hormones. But here's the thing. The, the, the hormone discoverer <laughs> thing might actually have been true because Dr. Ivy did collaborate on over like 1,500 papers and his research interests were like everything. So he had research in gastroenterology, ulcers, syphilis, drug and alcohol addiction, treatments for polio, vitamin deficiencies, converting seawater into drinking water, and most especially the physiological impact of skydiving. Nice. Wow. Right? So That's like, a range. I, I feel like when he was interviewing for a job, they were like, so... So what are you interested in? He's just like, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, there's nothing he almost said no to. And he researched it all. Hey, science doesn't get sexier than that. I bet his lab was sponsored by Red Bull back in the day. Durovic and all the business bros go over to Ivy at the University of Illinois, and he, they give him their pitch. And he responds with some reasonable scientific skepticism. Durovic wouldn't say what was in the drug, like I said, or exactly how he made it. And Dr. Ivy told him that, hey, look, even if it works, it's unlikely that Cosaterin would be brought to market since, you know, you need to kind of like show what it is and that it works and before the FDA is going to approve it. But Dr. Ivy also said, hey, you know what? I'm going to try it out, not on university time, but in my own patients and uh, see if it has any, quote, scientific or humanitarian benefit, end quote. So Durovic and the business dudes all leave Ivy's office perhaps dejected. I don't know. It's hard to say. But the most amazing thing happened next because Durovic was a genius, right? And he spent the subsequent month geniusing so hard until he returned to Ivy's office in August of 1949 with the one weird trick that can cure one of the most loathed diagnoses of all time, cancer. 
like all the cancers. He says, I discovered mm. the cure for cancer. Okay, That's I'm suspicious again. Are, are you? Okay. <laughs> here, here I am suspicious again. Sounds fishy. You Just know, all of them. Interesting thing is most of the doctors of the time also said the same thing, but um, if, the, if the essay was going to end there, it would have ended there, and it sure doesn't. Yeah, I want to see where this goes. Yeah, well, well, not really. Well, stay stay here, Aaron. Mm-hmm. Hang out. Because we'll, that's we'll we'll still here, there. too, along with the, the high blood pressures. The, the yeah. Can I make a bet? Yeah. Can I bet that they don't cure those things? Uh, can I you, bet that? If you can find a taker for it. Mike, you want to take that I'll bet? I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's the wager? <laughs> he takes the bet before the wager. I respect it. <laughs> yeah. So according to himself, Dr. Durovich, and no reasonable objective data, it just so happened that he did discover the cure for cancer, and he wanted to share it with Dr. Ivy, the esteemed world-class physiologist. It was so special that when Durovich told Ivy about this new cure, that Argentinian businessman, Umberto Lortani, hadn't even heard of it. Like, it's that exciting. <laughs> hadn't heard of cancer? Hadn't heard of the cure being discovered oh. by his client. <laughs> Wait, what is this? Oh gosh, why is why am I learning about this just now? Because it works too good. <laughs> so, a quick aside, just for just kind of bring everybody up to speed on kind of the general how cancer works. At its most basic level, cancer is basically when cells of the body grow uncontrollably and spread to other parts of the body. We have trillions of cells in the body. And many of those break into different types. You've got your skin cells, your breast cells, your colon cells, your brain cells, et cetera, right? And cancer can basically arise in any of them. Under normal circumstances, cells divide into new cells. You start with one, you get another one, on and so on, until you get a piece of tissue of whatever type. And then those cells should stop dividing at some point. When a cell becomes cancerous, such as, you know, gets a mutation of its genetic material, it does not stop creating copies of itself, and it continues to divide and divide and forms a tumor, in this case, a cancerous tumor. And when those cancer cells find their way to other parts of the body, that cancer has spread and becomes more challenging to treat. I would wager that, unfortunately, most, if not all of us, have some experience knowing somebody who's gone through this, right? So this was a big deal now as it very much was then, because now we know a lot more about cancer than they did in the time of this story. In the 1940s, especially the late 1940s, cancer treatment was essentially limited to surgery and radiation. Chemotherapy was in its infancy. A diagnosis of cancer in the mid-20th century carried a very high mortality. And nowadays, we have so many more choices of treatment because we understand it better. Let's take breast cancer, for instance. There's so many different receptors, meaning little cellular Uh, signatures and parts that we can check for. And that lets us know which treatments, some of which are chemotherapy, some of which are um, immune system modifying things, some of which are actually hormones that we can use to treat it best as possible. At the time that this story was taking place, your options for breast cancer were a radical mastectomy, maybe radiation. And if that cancer was to return after those things, there really was nothing else to be done. And this also was the time frame where three or four doctors recommended camels. So, you yeah, know, there, yeah. there, were, there were a lot of things we didn't know. Yeah, so, yeah. and then untrue. the dentist recommended menthols because it kept your breath nice and minty fresh. <laughs> yeah. They're looking it, at it, it like, did, oh, though. that tumor looks bad. It, it, it <laughs> did, though. What we're going to do. <laughs> well, then along comes Durovich. He claims, I have discovered a substance that was able to stop cancer cells from mo- multiplying. He had got some horses in Argentina. He infected them with a bacterium called Actinomyces bovis, and then he used this to stimulate their, quote, reticuloendothelial system, end quote, which refers kind of generally to a bunch of cells of the immune system that eat and remove threats to the body. We call those cells macrophages. I think by extension of his logic, he made the horse macrophages, their immune cells, all want to attack and eat cancer cells, uh, except in people. So he was roughly... 125 years ahead of his time? Mm. Uh, no. Well, if that story was true, <laughs> yes. But, okay, spoiler, it may not have been true. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Maybe it was true, listener. How do you know? I don't know if I know. Sounds suspicious. <laughs> so by, by doing this, Durovich caused the horses to basically make this new mysterious substance that he was 
claiming to have discovered. He had yet to name it at that time. He was calling it something like Substance X. But he said, I found a way to isolate this from the horse's blood. And he brought it along with him as he returned to the United States. And he wanted to give it to Dr. Ivy to try out on his patients. And hey, you see for yourself how these astounding results. Like, true salesman. Like, here, just let's put the vial in your hands. Just hold it. You know, hang on to it. What do you, what do you think? You know, don't tell me no yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Durovich said as well, I, look, I've been treating patients in the last month in Argentina with this. It works. You can totally trust me. And I'm sure his fingers weren't crossed behind his back. This uh, patient population in Argentina is kind of like your girlfriend in Canada in seventh grade. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. The one that you talk to all the time, but none yep. of your friends have totally met. Totally real. Mm-hmm. Totally real. I will note that this is probably the last time I'm going to laud the scientific skepticism of Dr. Andrew Ivey. Because <laughs> now he's a believer. Well, he does yeah. agree to do some trials on his clinic patients with terminal cancers. There's no IRB, no ethics boards, no animal people safety studies. That's for the birds. This is 1949. All you needed to inject your patients with a mysterious substance from overseas that was made from horse blood was a man's word in scientific <laughs> gumption. That you think it was, yeah. Dear you really don't know Lord. Anything. There were loopholes. So Dr. Ivy and a few of his colleagues tried this mysterious substance, which was made available to them in these little glass ampules. And somebody want to describe what an ampule is and why we hate them? <laughs> little the- glass vials with this weird, like, blown glass on top. It's all self-contained. Yep. And then scored around the top. So in order to open them, you just put a little pressure on it, and it's supposed to break right along that scored line. Never does. Yeah, it, but it rarely does. So then you just you have shattered glass with the medicine. Yeah, you're supposed to use a special needle with a filter. We have a lot of lidocaine, I think. So numbing medicine and ampules. It's the only time we really access them. I would Why? imagine it's a perfect seal, though. Like I bet it oh. seals because it's an entirely glass case. You know, whatever. But. Long story short, yeah, so he has all these little ampules. He brings them with him, and they start injecting these folks with it. They do about they do, you know, a couple handfuls of patients with the drug, and they measure tumors, like literally with rulers. They pull out rulers, and they measure the tumors, and um, they ask about symptoms. You know, how are you feeling? How is your eating if you weren't eating well? And basically, Dr. Ivy is amazed because he says, hey, this drug is working. He's finding tumor size is shrinking. Patients are reporting more energy. Pain seems to decrease. And, and Dr. Ivy is sold at this point. Does Durovich supply the rulers? No. Great question. <laughs> you though. wonder like, if the rulers are getting bigger and bigger. And, and then like, <laughs> oh, these tumors are shrinking. <laughs> yeah. No, there, there is an explanation, but we'll, we'll circle back to it in time. Like I said, he's pretty amazed. Ivy is saying, like, I'm finding all this stuff going the right direction. And this is a good time to add that Dr. Ivy and the colleagues who helped do these initial tests were not cancer specialists. And uh, Ivy had not been in clinical medicine for many years. So just Mm -hmm. as the excitement is building that they might have indeed found the cure for cancer, another character enters the chat. And that is Stefan's brother, Marco Durovich who was like the suave lawyer who also took refuge in Argentina and he happens to represent his brother's business interests, which they keep <laughs> very close to their chest, including keeping a very tight watch over the intellectual property rights of this mysterious substance, which I should say, again, is being called Substance X, making my new rule to be wary of anything branded with an X these days. Ah, it's not bad. Ah, Wait, ah, nice. so you're wary of the there spot? Yes. Because X marks the spot. Because X marks the spot. Yeah. yeah it's not that's, branding. Yeah. Also treasure. What about, is there a yeah. wrestler called Triple X? And that is oh, a rapper. It's a rapper. Um, okay. There's Triple H though. So I will give partial go. credit for mm. trying. And Triple X is something else, <laughs> Alba. That's where similarly built men oh, do gosh. similar things okay. on film. <laughs> I mean, there's you, less oil. You're not more wrong. oil. I'm not going to say you're wrong. <laughs> Uh, okay, so Dr. Ivy and these other clinicians who first worked with him to test Substance X were, they were trying to explain again to Stefan Durovich that like, okay, in order to carry this miraculous drug forward in the U.S. markets, assuming it works, you, we need some realer science on it, right? <laughs> you get, more realer. American more realer. medical. <laughs> yeah, more more real science. More real than fake rulers. <laughs> real rulers, like the, the ones that are metal, not wooden. Mm. So they're... He's like the American Medical Association, the FDA, 
are not going to lend it any credibility or approve the secret mystery drug if Durovich can't tell them what's in it. Uh, and they were like, he couldn't even patent it if the formula and process aren't shared. Can we uh, pause for a second? Because, okay, so there uh, there is the FDA mm-hmm. at this time, but you don't need any kind of approval to just start injecting people? <laughs> Great question. So it is touched on in the book a little bit. There were a lot of loopholes. Mm. So a lot of one of the ways the substance kind of flew be, below the radar is that it got kind of mixed in as an experimental treatment. Now you would think you you I, I found this dude who you know came from another land and he has the cure for cancer. I do want to try injecting it on my patients. Like the informed consent, considering that that was the origin of this this drug, is probably not there. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's terrifying that it was that wide open. But it, in this case, he was able to use it in the clinic as an experimental thing. He was not able to sell it, which will come up in a little bit. So Durovich, though, he's not sharing this information. He says a bunch of things like, I, I don't want the formula to fall to the communist hands. So that was one of his big excuses. Like, I just don't want it. <laughs> which, look, it's 1940s, 50s, yeah. 50s. Yeah, it's, that's... <laughs> communists are everywhere. The communists were everywhere, yeah. of course. We all know that now. So they wouldn't want the communists then to be able to cure cancer in their own country as well. <laughs> no. So he's using it Can as we a weapon? That's not nice. Well, I yeah. mean, it's not nice when you use it that way. But his whole thing was like, they're going to take it. And, and he's trying to play, I think he's trying to play that like, well, America, you want this because you know you don't want them to have it. Because what if they have it and then you can't have it? <sighs> Here's the other thing. It should be noted that the when the drug is given to Dr. Ivy's team, it's coming in these ampules, and those ampules are full of mineral oil. And according to the book, it makes that like they couldn't really test what the substance was at the time because of the mineral oil. So and I, I will tell you, I don't remember all the chemistry reasons why that might be true. I don't fully care to remember. I don't know if I ever really understood it, but I wouldn't understand it if you tried to explain it. So I'm not gonna try <laughs> to explain it. We're all gonna be fine. But yeah, so it's like you can't they can't isolate anything from these vials and it's just in there, trust me. While the Durovich, Durovics, we'll say, hesitate to give any specifics, the press does get wind that there may be a big discovery brewing at the University of Illinois. On March 26, 1951, Dr. Ivy decided to hold a research conference on Substance X at the Drake Hotel in Chicago. He calls together doctors, scientists, cancer researchers, a few journalists, even a few politicians to give a presentation about the new drug, its effects, his findings, etc. You know, just a nice low-key poster presentation. It's at that time that the drug is given its name, Kribiozin, which is derived from the Greek words for cancer and censor. I'm sure that etymology is probably confirmable with like a quick internet search, but I, I chose to believe Dr. Dervik was probably <laughs> just making that fact up too. I don't know. It could be true. But Krabiosin is the name of our wonder drug now. And a bunch of uninvited journalists crash this presentation and it becomes a huge zoo. Everybody is really eager to report on a cure for cancer. And they're eager to report that it's been found. And Dr. Ivy makes the unfortunate mistake of going forward with the presentation. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, it's kind of... Well, she doesn't even know what it is yet. What the hell? You it's, yeah, that uh, uh, Aaron that would be that would be where I would stop too. Uh, that's, that's yeah, but just imagine this like it's a lot of pressure. You're yeah, a performer. I, you're on a side stage. The party bus just drops off a bunch of people. You're like, you know what? Let's do this. This is the biggest crowd we've had all year. <laughs> cancer, I mean, cure. As somebody who's done poster presentations, you do get desperate for attention after a while. I, I do get fair it. enough. Fair enough. So the Drake Hotel presentation causes this whole fervor in the press about Krabiosin. The appetite for wanting a cure for cancer was high enough, but now we're talking about like a time of scientific popularity, right? This is the post-atomic age, early space days. We can do anything we put our minds to, those levels of excitement. So it's not super surprising to me that this got such a a boost. Senators are now asking for the drug for themselves or for their families. And major Chicago newspapers are reporting on the possibility that, hey, they might have found a cure for cancer in, in one of our universities. Thousands of people are writing and tens of thousands of people are calling the University of Illinois wanting to get a hold of the medication out of what I would say is very understandable desperation, right? Oh, yeah. Well, it's understandable why people would want this. I mean, that's... Yes. Yeah. So I certainly don't fault that, especially back then. Even now. 
Well, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And hey, look, Eli Lilly even approached Dr. Durovich about marketing Krabiazin. And they were like, hey, we'll give you a million dollars for this plus whatever, you know, whatever we make, that, 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 that. But man, you got to tell us what it is. And also, we're only giving that money if it actually works. And he was like, no, I don't want to have your money. Mm-hmm. I'm suspicious you can. Mm. <laughs> well, you and Eli Lilly both were. And so they walked away for the moment. Suspicious Sean Connery. <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> he was probably in his 40s when this came out. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true. Now, the American Medical Association enters the game as Krabiosin comes to their attention. So there's a bunch of publications talking about this. The magazine Science published unfavorable commentary from an established oncologist regarding the medication. New England Journal of Medicine ran an editorial dragging IV and Krabiosin as, quote, out and out frauds that are perpetrated on the public, end quote. And they also wrote that such drugs came from, quote, a mixture of egoism and enthusiasm in some scientifically myopic person. (laughs) I just... That's good writing, though. It's Come a on. nice way to put it, too, honestly. It is very... Kind of like he's wishing that this is something that could work. Because he right. really hasn't marketed anything yet. He hasn't really tried to make any money off of it yet. That is that is true. So it was at this point that the AMA wanted to do its own test of the substance. So they started going about doing that. And Dr. Durovich wrote to the AMA to try and install the report that they were brewing. Probably because he knew the results would be too good. Uh, but mm-hmm, yeah, <laughs> the AMA published a report in October 1951 after they obtained 100 case studies from around the country, including some of those from the University of uh, Illinois, mm-hmm. uh, from their own oncology clinic and the cancer experts in Chicago, which is basically who reviewed all those cases. And that is also where the AMA is located. Examine the cases. They concluded that, quote, not one of the patients observed has shown any appreciable alteration in the course of the primary tumor growth, although two patients showed equivocal temporary response. So out of that hundred, maybe two cases, like they look like they might have kind of improved, but it wasn't entirely sure. But the rest of them, the cancer experts were like, we don't see any improvement with this stuff. They're using the wrong rulers. They should have been getting the rulers <laughs> yeah. from from the Duravik guy. You're absolutely right. Uh, The other thing was that in that case series, 100 people, 44 had already died by the time that this report gets published from their cancer. The AMA's findings failed to find what Dr. Ivey saw in this practice. The medical establishment thought Grabiosin was worthless at best and a hoax at worst. But hey, look, it could be both of those things, right? And it is. We don't know that yet, Alba. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I am being objective. I'm sorry. I'm... (laughs) I'm a detective. I'm just being <laughs> So one thing that Dr. Ivy failed to mention at the Drake Hotel presentation that drew up all this fervor is that before the scathing AMA report came out, that many of the patients that claimed to see improvement, that he claimed to see improvement from, had already died shortly after they were trying Krabiosin on them. This was a pattern that you'll see a repeat over and over again in this story. Patients who were given the drug were often dying soon afterward for what would have been basically a normal, I don't want to say normal, but the the course of their cancer if it was not treated at all, right? And this is a really important detail to mention, but you will see that it does not get mentioned many places in the press and whenever Ivy is kind of brought to task about it. I wonder during that presentation if he said it, but everybody was cheering so loudly. And he's like, this is the perfect time to say that they all died. You're saying he <laughs> so muttered it, hear he it. muttered it like yeah. under, like away from the microphone, <laughs> yep. but technically it got on the record so he can say he said he was... it. Everybody knew it. He still applauded. They showed some improvement and then they died. And... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Had a baby, yeah. it's a boy. <laughs> <laughs> so the newspapers like the Chicago Tribune and a bunch of other mainstays of the day reported on the AMA's findings. They were, as I mentioned, that Krabiazin was ineffective, do not recommend status. Many other major news outlets spread the word, and a man named George Stoddard, who happened to be the president of the University of Illinois, was way more than happy to see this drug buried. He was well aware of Dr. Ivy's odd fascination with Krabiazin and the dubious Dr. Durovic. And Stoddard wanted the university to be rid of all of it. Uh, he was worried about the university's reputation in the whole affair. 
and uh, he may or may not have been right, as we'll find out. <laughs> okay, well, we like him. I like him. We like Stoddard. I think we like Stoddard. That's mm-hmm. definitely a, a thing. There was a lot, by the way, of back and forth, be- like behind the scenes stuff between him and Dr. Ivy, because Stoddard's technically his boss. That was a big chunk of the book. It was really fascinating. I'm focusing on the medicine here, so that's a lot of the book that I just am not going into here. But those two, they're like battles against each other were pretty interesting. Stoddard had been aware of the fact that nobody had been able to say what this drug is. And thanks to its mysterious ampule, like mineral oil packaging, and just like he was just generally healthily suspicious of Durovich's trust me bro evidence, it, he said, Stoddard said that it is my considered opinion that except possibly as a common, harmless, inexpensive ingredient, cribiazin does not exist, which... Is kind of technically true, but <laughs> well, so far we haven't seen it. It's it's the dubious oil so far. Yeah, dubious Doctor Dervik is that's my favorite Nancy Drew novel so far. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's absolutely what he is. But it, here's Stoic the thing, Stoddard. <laughs> he said it didn't exist, and maybe it didn't, but the idea of it sure did. And so let's let's recap where we are right now. We have the majority of the scientific and medical establishment calling Crabios in a failure. That included a bunch of trials and consensus reports that I haven't touched on in the show. That's a lot of cool stuff in the book. The genius who said he discovered it won't say how it's made, won't disclose what his active ingredient is, even after he had assurances that, dude, if you patent this, you still get ownership rights. That's not how it works. Nope, he would not say it. And then finally, the president of the university where the wonder drug was brought to study was all too happy to get away from it, right? So Cribiozin is done, stick a fork in it, but obviously that's just not going to be the case. Between the Drake Hotel press coverage and a litany of marketers and writers who are eager to push the supposed successes of Cribiozin, a legion of believers developed. They were prepared to bitterly defend the drug against mountains of evidence that were basically piling up against it. Dr. Ivy was swept up in all of this, and along so were his colleagues. There were celebrities and politicians that were swearing by the drug. There's even a documentary called Curbiosin and Cancer, 13 Years of Bitter Conflict, which was made in 1964, which is like, what, 14 years after, well, 13 years, I guess, after the main release. And this this basically overviewed a large portion of the ensuing circus in this drug. I did watch parts of that documentary, which uh, was very 1964. It's kind of interesting. I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd sit through the whole thing, but... (laughs) <laughs> it, this was a big, this is kind of a big deal at the time. Durovic and Ivy had gone on the offensive at this time. In the decade after the Drake Hotel, they go out and they are attacking any medical organization that speaks out against Cribiozin. They're, you know, the AMA is crooked. The, uh, I, mean, I mean, honestly, they might have been, but not for this reason, let's be clear. The, you know, the medical journals are against us. The FDA is against us. They don't want us to to release the cure for cancer. And when Stoddard, the president of the University of Illinois, said Cribiosin doesn't exist, it just made fodder for conspiracy theorists to work with. The medical establishment, initially through the AMA and later through the FDA, were seeking to suppress the truth that this medication worked. That was the line. Does that sound familiar at all? Is this ever... Nah, that never happens. No, yeah. that's got to be a once in a lifetime, once in a historical Why is it always horses? Event. It's yeah, always, weird it's thing always is, horses. But it still hasn't been monetized. That makes more sense if it's monetized, you know? Oh, hasn't it? Because <laughs> he was selling it, right? Mm, he, no, he wasn't technically selling it. But you know how, like, that would make more sense for these guys to push that. Like, Absolute fair question. It there's money on the line and there's more money, the more discord they sow. That's a very apt point. We will, we will definitely talk about some money. So you might in this time find a pro Curbios in pamphlet or magazine with headlines such as quote, real hope to cure cancer end quote, or quote, big lie bans cancer drug or doomed to die. They still live. These are all actual like pamphlets or magazines that you would find circulating around. A book con- considered to be the Bible of the pro Probiosin movement was written by Herbert Bailey, who titled the first edition K. Crabiosin, Key to Cancer? Question mark, which I just... <laughs> it's a lot of Ks. Uh, Why? Uh, yeah, it's a lot of Ks. There's, there's three Ks there, which is... Why? Uh, mm, yeah. Yeah. And then there's a question mark. I will say, if you're going to title your book with a question mark, I will probably never take it seriously. Just leave <laughs> yeah. it home. I can't 
help but mention this other little factoid, but that that book was published by Hermitage House in early 1955, the very same publisher that John Travolta and Tom Cruise have to thank for their favorite book, L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics. I think that means the Cribios and Propaganda is the second most insane thing that company's ever published. (laughs) Yeah. Careful, bro. They're going to come for us. Yeah, let's do it. I will fight them all. (laughs) I mentioned celebrities hitching their cart to this madness, and one of them was Gloria Swanson, who you guys definitely remember as the silent film icon who starred as Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like you guys don't know who that is. No, I don't. I'm so sorry. No idea. Even the actor doesn't know Gloria Swanson. I I mean, you know, I I get made fun of a lot for not knowing things that I ought to know as an actor. It's okay, because... It's not 1940 or 51, right? So you would, Alba in 1951 definitely knows who this is. I am no Wait, clue so who she this would have was. been a retired star then. If yeah, it, more or less. If she was a silent she did film a few star. Things, but yeah, I know. I'm just, she is apparently a star though. She's well known and she becomes a big Krabiosin proponent. She's doing media promotion for the drug. She even sits as a chairperson on the Committee for Independent Cancer Research, which is a <laughs> totally independent, mm-hmm. non biased group <laughs> that was founded to promote favorable literature about Krabiazin. I like to think of her as the Jenny McCarthy of the story, a popular celebrity with really bad ideas about science. All of this fervor and so much more that I, I haven't mentioned again, referring back to the book, basically drove a collection of people to go after this medication and they paid out of pocket for Krabiazin treatment. So Mike, you had mentioned he's not selling it. Technically, mm. that's true because Durovich said he wouldn't charge people for the medication. He was a humanitarian after all. He would, however, ask for a $9.50 donation per ampule of this stuff to you know, <laughs> cover his costs. It works out to about 115 bucks a day, you know, a treatment. And he told many, including Dr. Ivy, that he and his brother were millions of dollars in debt just funding the production and development of mm. probiosin. So really, all they were asking for the donations for, they just needed to pay their debtors. They needed to pay to make the medication. And, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe someday it'll be worth something. Uh, they were also definitely taking those donations and putting them in Swiss bank accounts and stuff mm. like that. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So he definitely was profiting off of this, but he could not sell it. He could give it away for donations. <laughs> Though, yeah, it sounds suspicious. <laughs> so uh, the other fun part of the story is that uh, it involved a bunch of senators helping the Durovich brothers to stay in the U.S. and avoid all these immigration concerns. And uh, and even with all those donations coming in, they the, those brothers did not like paying taxes. So that was also kind of an issue. And despite the hefty cost, you know, 115 bucks per dose. And the fact that people were on this medication awfully weekly, often weekly until they died. And then all the other sketch stuff that I mentioned, the people continued to flock for the medication. At one point, the FDA and regulators did increase scrutiny and were able to bar, bar the interstate distribution of Krabios and kind of untested experimental drugs like it. But people would fly from all over the country and even the world to Illinois to buy it for the donation. You know, however, our donations seem to work in this world. People really wanted to believe in this drug and they were, they were really going out of their way to get it. I had the thought of like, so wouldn't, wouldn't you know though, like, okay, all these people are taking it, but you know, if you look at how many people are being cured from it versus how many people are just going about the Mm. natural Mm -hmm. course of the disease, You would think that people would be like, okay, the evidence is clear. But then I thought the COVID vaccines Mm -hmm. and you could look, you know, like in 2024 or whatever year the COVID vaccine came out, you would, you would think that uh, we would have data like that more accessible to people, but it doesn't, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem that way. Yeah. But now all the data is accessible to people and you could choose whatever you feel makes you feel better. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting point. Yeah. Then it than... wasn't available, and now everything is available. Well, mm-hmm. actually, yeah. So I think Alba, that's a, a very fair point, and probably the answer to that from my reading here is that the data was there, but hard to get and of very low quality. So mm-hmm. most people who were really fixated on the data, you know, like the 
AMA and FDA. Yeah. <laughs> we're definitely looking at it going, this is all BS. This is abject BS. But the press was, mm. even when they reported the AMA findings, the perhaps brilliance, if you want to use that word, of the media push that these guys did over one that the rationality went to the wayside and kind of the emotional argument for wanting this medication to work really took hold. So at that point, the facts didn't matter anymore. Yeah. Just drowning out the facts with the scam, mm-hmm. basically. Yep. So the people who believed in this drug included some stories like that of Diane Lindstrom of Rockford, Illinois, who in 1963 found out the pain in her leg was a bone cancer. She was a senior in high school, I hate to mention. The recommended treatment of that time would have been amputation, understandably a pretty drastic thing for a person her age. A family member of a hospital employee told the Lindstrom family about Krabiozin, and that was basically all it took, that they canceled the operation like two days prior. They, she started taking the medication, and her pain vanished. Her tumor was, quote, appeared to shrink. And that was according to Dr. Ivy, who noted that Lindstrom would, quote, rather die than go through life without a leg. Lindstrom's story and others like it garnered national news attention. Rather die than go through life without a leg is, I was just going to say that's a horribly ironic thing to say. Yeah. Well, think about, yeah, Bob Marley. Yeah. Mm, yeah because she, she's gonna, she's going to die instead of yeah, going through life without a life. Yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah. Now, this appeared to shrink business. I mean, it you, you know, the thing it's it's the doctor and the patient looking at the leg saying, I think it's getting better. And, you know, I mean, the placebo effect. So you're going to mm-hmm. think it's getting better because, you you know, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think but. that someday we should do a placebo effect show. But yeah, I, you know, so there is some effect that, of these things. I think what you're pointing out, Aaron, is subjective stuff. Stuff that's harder to measure. Now, I know we talked about rulers. I get that. But Mm -hmm. rulers measuring tumors, especially if you're not like an official oncologist at the time, et cetera, is still not super reliable. So I think you're absolutely right that those um, type of things, when they were going by, I feel better. I I think things are going the right direction as evidence here. That is a main reason that this all comes tumbling down. It's also hope. You know, it is absolutely hope that it, hope. Yeah. Yep. You're going to believe things are getting better because you have to, because you have hope. Yeah. And that's what this had gave these people. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, when you look at it, a lot of these stories leave out the part where Lindstrom, she died five months after starting Kerbiosin. They often left out the cases where someone was said to be cured by Kerbiosin, not just improved. In a lot of those cases, there was no real actual documentation that the person had cancer in the first place. So there would be these cases where it's like so-and-so took it and now they're still around, but they really didn't know that they had cancer. So finally, the FDA kind of has enough. Amidst all of this, there's this increasing public outcry. There's letter writing campaigns turned to full-blown protests and picketing outside of the White House. People are demanding Krabiosin be made available and despite numerous efforts on the part of government agencies to work with Durovich to conduct all the testing of the drug itself, like just finally for all, like let's just be done with it. Let's do safety testing. Let's vet the substance. Let's just get it done with. He continues to drag his feet, excuse after excuse as far as why he wouldn't hand it over for this excuse, that excuse. And the FDA goes, all right, it's enough. In 1963, they just started investigating him. And I don't know whether the FDA like sends out undercover scientists or whatever, but it's kind of what they described here. Like just these, I'm guessing. Just a bunch of nerds into the wild. Yeah, kind of like <laughs> Go- hiding <laughs> nerd newspapers. It's a scene and, like, in, in Ghostbusters. He just Excuse goes running me. into Central Park. Uh, can you show me your manufacturing process? <laughs> yeah. Are you the key master? Are you the key master? <laughs> I'm the gatekeeper. Are you the key master? <laughs> It's exactly how it went down. Uh, they, so they, they're like following. They went to this dog food plant where Durovich had had some veterinarian injecting what do you horses. Feed your what? Dog? Well, <laughs> they're making the medicine in a dog food plant. Yes, that's appropriate. They're making the medicine in the dog uh, food plant. I'll throw plant? this out there. So Durovich had a veterinarian there injecting horses with this actinomyces bovis to like make oh, the drug. Oh, and then they were going to get made into dog. Food. Yeah, don't say it out loud. <laughs> we know. We all know. I don't, I don't want to say why there are horses at a dog food factory in the 60s. Oh, no. 
They're all, <laughs> nothing bad happened to them. It's okay. But the FDA agents arrived there. Durovic had already called ahead and told a veterinarian to send him all the blood that he'd drawn. The FDA agents go over to Durovic soon thereafter, and he says, oh, geez, I just dumped all the blood down the drain because it went bad. <laughs> oh, so geez, Rick. literally following. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. Oh, 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 Look at the timing oh, on it's that. Just would, here. You, would you like, believe it? That's crazy. Wait, was the plant in Racine? Oh, <laughs> uh, <geez. laughs> I don't know, actually. So at one point, <laughs> the FDA agents, at one point, the FDA agents basically threatened to visit Durovic's, Durovic's laboratory until he showed them the manufacturing process they're like we're going to show up every day like you're just they're gonna, they literally cornered him there and he got so frustrated he took whatever powder that was nearby that was supposedly the drug he dumped it into a beaker of water yelling something about this was his manufacturing process and like tossed it like cocaine we actually will get to what the powder was so it was cocaine it, you'd think it was cocaine you're not far off you are but it's something that makes you feel good short term, gives you a little bit of energy boost. Well, ultimately, however, the FDA, while at the same time, they're massing all these, they're, they're collecting all these patient records, x-rays, pathology reports, everything they can find on like every patient treated with carbiosin. Uh, they were finally able to secure samples of the drug that were testable. They isolated a substance. They were able to put it into an IR spectrometer. Do you guys remember those from organic yeah. chemistry? That was my favorite yes. device because it was so what? dumb. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It was terrible. You get this like scattering of stalactites on a piece of paper and you're like, ah, it might be aspirin. I don't know. But they, they were able to get the substance. They were able to get those readouts. They did this with like four different labs. They're like, you all test it and then let's see what we figure out. And they took these, these four identical spectrographs from the samples and they had to like match them manually, like go to the big book of spectrograph results Stuff. and like would see which one it matched. And they did. They found a match. And you know what it was? Not cocaine. It was creatine. <laughs> right? Oh. You said they were finance bros. Those guys lived. That's <laughs> not untrue. <laughs> yeah. So the wow. cryobiosin that they could find was actually creatine. And yeah, at best, the... The vials of cryobiosin, they might contain some creatine dissolved in mineral oil. Wait, you're saying is, creatine cures cancer? You would think if it did, we would know it by now. Um, yeah, I don't but think. but I don't it, think people inject it, so maybe we should try that. That's, well, here's <laughs> sure the thing. They do. It's, it is the same substance you buy over the counter at like GNC, right? We're not sponsored by them. It's just the first thing I could think of. We will be soon. You, it gets you all <laughs> swole. It like, you know, and whatnot. It basically, it's a naturally occurring substance in all vertebrates in your muscle cells, whether you're a horse, whether you're a human. And it's involved in helping generate energy through reducing equivalent, something ATP, something kinase, blah, blah, Krebs cycle, bo boring. Not going to go back there. But creatine might help with sports performance. It just doesn't reverse terminal cancer, unfortunately. Well, what about all those other ampules and vials of mineral oil that seem to be that seem to make cryobiosin untestable? Well, they're probably just mineral oil. Like there was not necessarily something in every vial. And it was being sold, I'm sorry, donated, or it was being <laughs> accepted for money in the form of donation to a bunch of desperate cancer patients. So yeah, yeah, that's uh that's that's what was going on here. Speaking of which, the FDA wanted to prove that carbiosin was being also shipped across state lines. So not only was it a hoax, but it's being shipped illegally. This is one of my favorite anecdotes from the book. To do this, to prove it was being sent, they sent phony letters to the Carbiosin Research Foundation, pretending to be patients asking for the medication like in another state. Some of the indications, they were like, I am a patient and I had a double pneumonectomy. I need cryobiosin to continue with my health. With my life. Yeah. So <laughs> said both my lungs removed. Okay. Yeah. I was like, isn't that what pneumonectomy is? You only got two. So the FDA was making up these phony, like life ending surgeries like. and sending, I had a double pneumonectomy because of my cancer and I need cryobiosin. And they were just like, yep, here we go. Ship it away. Yeah, so they were building trying the case to show there. how stupid they are. Oh, yeah. Dear. Yes. Gotcha. So was the horse blood, did the, did the horse blood ever make it into one of the ampules or would did the horse blood have anything to do with it? Great question. Nobody ever really saw his process, but 
Dr. Ivy eventually did make his own cryobiosin-like medication. The thing is, you can find creatine in blood, and you can distill it, or you can get it from mussels. Like, so if you had just, you could probably isolate it from dog food, to be honest with you, whether there's horse in it or not, but you can <laughs> isolate it. It's not that hard to do. And Durovich would say, it takes me $170,000 to make a gram of cryobiosin. It's, it works out to about 80 cents an ampule if you're actually just doing creatine. So yeah, you, you big old liar. Wow. It's a big markup. It's a big markup for donation. Criminal charges were brought against the Durovich, Durovix, Dr. Ivy, and the pro Kerbiosin organizations, such as the Kerbiosin Research Foundation, after the FDA well, good. proved that the drug was a myth. Yeah, it is good. I agree with you. That trial ran for the better part of 1966, and it was so insane, it probably could be its own episode worth of material. So seriously, the whole proceedings were bonkers, and I would definitely encourage listeners to check out Ehrlich's book to read about it. In summary, though, the trial spent all that year pitting scientific evidence against Krabiosin, like a lot of evidence, against the defendants' claims, and that they were... It, it, they pitted all of that against the defendants' claims that they were just being persecuted by big medicine and that there was a large conspiracy involving the FDA and AMA and basically all of rationality, I guess. But that was working against their freedom to use the treatment they believed in. And the rhetoric was so vitriolic that flyers were circulating outside of the courthouse comparing the withholding of Krabiosin to the same crimes that the Nazi doctors committed. So it was just really heated mm. outside the courtroom as well pro curbios and protesters told the lead fda investigators he's leaving the courthouse that quote they hoped he'd die a horrible death from cancer end quote so mobs of people are outside this trial threatening people well they should have turned around and say i hope you'd try curbiosin <laughs> that would that would have been yeah i think that would have been guy wasn't on his mm. game no he wasn't <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna again. I'm just gonna summarize it. But if you can believe it, after all of those weeks of deliberations, after almost I think almost a whole year of trial, the jury found Dr. Ivy, Dr. Durovic, and all the associate parties not guilty. Yes, that's a jury of your peers. Yeah, <laughs> the, the flaw what? in the jury system, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there was pretty extensive evidence of a lot of jury tam tampering. So pro Kerbiosin authors were writing letters to the jury that were just being delivered. And although the jury did disclose some of these, they didn't really disclose what was in them. Some jurors had held back that they already had a very favorable view of the drug, no matter what the evidence was going to say, and they were already going to find positively. One of the jurors' actions were so egregious that he was found in contempt after the trial. I'm sorry, where's the CIA during this time i mean they are like <laughs> i think if this bay is of a pigs, major I think they're in the bay of pigs right now. i know but I, what i'm saying is if this is like a major Cambodia? thing where this these people are like they're manipulating all high the populace they would know how to take these guys down so quick they just true. you could just say like okay krabiazin and this guy they're communists sure you're done true. A lot of politicians were in this pro camp, and I wonder if that might have had something to do with it. I don't think the CIA mm -hmm. was mentioned once in the book. I could be wrong, but I think this was so popular at high levels that, and is even one, I don't touch on it here, but Lyndon Johnson gets involved in this whole mess at some point, trying to bail out this drug. He doesn't, but there's that. Okay, so by this time, Durovic is still facing all the pending charges for his filing of false tax returns and stuff that happened along the way. He hops a plane with a passport that the U.S. government gave back to him after he was found not guilty, and he goes to Europe, and he settles in Switzerland right next to one of those big old bank accounts of his, which was probably laden with $3.7 I think was one of the figures in the book. So he never returns to the U.S., and he just lives out his life. As for Dr. Ivy, his reputation was basically completely ruined. Even before the trial in 1964, Life magazine published a profile of Ivy under the headline, quote, whatever happened to Dr. Ivy, and described the latter part of his career as, quote, tattered medical sideshow, end quote. And that was contrasted against his earlier prestige. Ivy found some jobs here and there with smaller universities, and he even developed his own version of this, this 
basically fake cancer drug. He called it Carcolon, <laughs> which was identical to Crabiacin because it was also creatinine. <laughs> this creatine. dummy should have just been chelating the cancer. Doesn't he know anything? God. Hey, seriously, seriously. <laughs> and here's the thing. He used that on patients up until 1978 age he died age 84 so he definitely was a believer to the end and that is kind of the beginning the end of what was essentially a 22 year saga of madness and the ultimately proven to be hoax for biosyn i mean i'm glad that cancer patients don't have to worry about any people saying that they have cures anymore i mean Absolutely. that's kind of you know thank goodness we've gotten far past uh, that but there yeah i mean there are yes you know what's fascinating? His initial description of what the, these it did, what Crobiosin did, the reprogrammed immune cells of the horse that go kill the cancer, like that's not far off from a plain language description of what CAR T cells do, because those are reprogrammed T cells, and the immunology and the science is way beyond me, but it is real that for the right kind of cancer with the right kind of sort of process like we can now reprogram t-cells to specifically attack mm -hmm. cancer which is that's why you were saying he was ahead of his time yeah that's like a hundred and it like it it is pretty fascinating it's just how do you it only works right now on blood can't well as of a few years back and i'm not an oncologist look like it worked better on like uh bloodborne cancers and then solid cancers which is the big problem but mm -hmm. i mean it, it's just crazy like he basically he had that's the thing about these hoaxes they have enough that sounds like it's plausible stuff. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. you just you just hammer on that. Big medicine doesn't want you to know because they want to keep you sick. Right. There's yeah, very untrusting feeling this time. You know, your your post war uh, you know, to me it seems like it's just the perfect time to have something like this happen. You don't trust the government. I mean, this mm -hmm, happens mm -hmm. regularly. Yeah. We see this quite a yeah. bit. Yeah, this Do you is think he's a time story. traveler? Oh, <laughs> Do you think he was from uh, no. the future where they had discovered a cure for cancer and he read in a paper and this is what it was. He described it perfectly in the beginning, but then he came back. And he's like, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I, don't so know that, how, I don't know what to do with horse blood. I think that that's as plausible us. as Kerbiosin working. There was a great thing. There's a story this comedian tells about being a time traveler. He's like, you know what? If I was a time traveler and I went back in time, I would never be able to prove that I was from the future. Because he'd be like, <laughs> like who's the next the president? Things. He'd be like, I don't remember. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got these things. You could talk on a phone that you carry in your pocket. But how do you make it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's not untrue. Yeah. Well, that's that's all I got for you guys. So, Alba, what... Uh, what did you manage to pick out and procure for artifact-wise from that episode to add to our PH Pod Annals of Medical History? Okay, I have a couple options. No, Max, you can only, I only know one. This might... Okay, all right. Um, horse blood. Okay, okay, horse blood. <laughs> That's just 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 put it in there, loose, or it? put it in a container. <laughs> I was gonna say I was gonna say an ampule of horse blood, but then I was like, well, technically, there's not an ampule of horse blood in the story. It's like conjecture. But then I thought an ampule of mineral oil, but that's not mm. as entertaining. And no. then I thought an ampule of creatine, but then I thought that gives it away. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. horse but what are you going to put the horse blood in, though? What's the an ampule. I like the ampule oh, you do? of horse okay. blood okay. myself, but okay. then I know Max might have to use Photoshop to make Yeah, but that's horse horse blood. Those are real. No, those are just artifacts that I have. Yeah, okay, no do we retake it? That? No, no, that's perfect. perfect. So I just say ampule of horse Oh, no, okay. You're going to keep all of that? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. What else I got to do? <laughs> All right. Well, okay. putting it in the vault. Once again, special yeah. thanks to Matthew Ehrlich, author of the Cribiosin Hoax, How a Mysterious Cancer Drug Shook Organized Medicine, for sending us that book, letting us review it, and inspiring this episode. It was it what really was a great read. I promise I left a lot of this story out. And so I do invite the listener to go check out the book, pick it up, enjoy it, add it to your library. With that, we do appreciate everyone listening. We'd love to hear from all of you out there. If you'd like to check out our merchandise or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.horrorstoriespod.com. There you can send us messages and find links to our social media sites. We do work to respond to all those posts on those various social media accounts. We want to thank our PH Pod patrons for helping make the show possible as well. We want to join them. To become a special part of the House of Medical History, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash podcast. A free way to support us is to go tell a friend about us or be one of those nice five-star reviews on Spotify, iTunes, or whichever platform you choose. Speaking of which, Elba, you want to read one for us? I do. This five-star review is titled, Fun. 
Having been a nurse for 30 years, I have learned to enjoy the quirky MD sense of humor. This podcast allows me to still enjoy that particular humor without having to clock in, and I usually learn something too. Oh, we like to see it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. We don't yeah, like clocking nice. in either. We're going to do a mean <laughs> one eventually, but we've we got to be in a good place for that. Until next time, poor historians are signing out. Hey, All right, let's do a count real quick for synchronization purposes. Join me on three. We'll stop at five. One. Wait, on two, three, stop at five. Three. Is that what you said? Four. Four. four yeah. Five. No, five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. We all stopped on five. It's true. One, two, two, three, three, three four, 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 five, five. 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 Okay. Aaron. What? It's that's there's when some I... delay because of the internet. As long as I kind of yeah, know shut that up. Happened. It's not you my fault. Back <laughs> off, not... Aaron. I heard okay. you, you didn't talk to me about me at all last week. <laughs> okay. Oh, did you listen to it, Aaron? <laughs> no. Oh, dude, my, you have I guess to. That my it's spies told me. I will. I will listen to it. I have a long drive ahead of me, so I do a really good Aaron. Do you? Mm. Let's hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at me! I'm Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> Not too bad. Can you, hey Mike, can you do an Alba? Look at me, I'm Alba. (laughs) (laughs) Look at me, I'm Mike. (laughs) Wow, you did a really good meme. Look at me, I'm Max. (laughs) (laughs) We did it. Woo. You You sounded like like that that. Simpsons character. uh, (laughs) Oh, Bart's friend. (laughs) Oh, no, he's not really. No, the bully. The bully. house. No. Yeah. <laughs> Millhouse's dad is such a dark character in retrospect, mm. like really dark. You ever think about that? No. I'm that. trying to remember who it is. I don't even remember who Millhouse's dad don't is. Have a cow, He's man. so sad and depressing. You don't even remember him. We should do room noise. Mm. I almost forgot. Mm. Let's do room noise. Oh, hey, sorry, y'all. Wait, I can't read. I'm so dyslexic. <laughs> Wait, hey. sorry, I'm y'all. Hey. <laughs> <laughs>